everybody thanks for watching and uh, welcome to ancient history part two now in this uh, DVD we really got to get into a lot of the ancient histories dealing with the Ptolemies because when you look at biblical history the ones that we know they copied off of you cannot go into ancient history and not talk about the Ptolemies so when we get into the Maccabees which Maccabees is in the Apocrypha remember in the 1880s they took out about 15 books from the Bible and in those 15 books you had Maccabees uh, 1 and 2 and you can find them in the uh, Catholic Bible but in the King James Version we went for a long time without having Maccabees and uh, 14 other books uh, of the Bible so when you start to realize that in Maccabees it's getting into Alexander and um, the Ptolemies so when you start to understand the history when you start to read Daniel you can look in Daniel and see that in Daniel it's talking about the Ptolemies although in the King James Version they don't really elaborate on names you'll get Darius you'll get uh, Alexander and Maccabees but not in the King James Version itself so the whole point is we really have to look at biblical history to see the reason why they kept the Ptolemies out and what all that is really talking about okay now before I forget I want to thank you guys for taking the time to watch and purchase and support I have a lot of new uh, upcoming DVDs coming out more videos on YouTube as well but we have to really get into this series to kind of bridge the gap between the history of what happened to Kemet and everything that happened after that that led up to the religion that we see today and everything that we see today so we're going to pick up back uh, with the Ptolemies and really start to understand that history and everything that took place after that because a lot of people don't realize that um, the Ptolemies play a huge role in you know establishing uh, the civilizations that we see in the so-called Middle East and, and Europe today and when you start to look around at what happened and all the wars that was going on which we'll get into I mean it makes everything makes sense as far as why the uh, Greeks were in power and how they was able to create the uh, the Torah and biblical religion as we know it so we're gonna get into that so now in part one we talked about Alexander and um, when you start to look back at that time in history and of course we know everything that happened with ancient Kemet and the Persians coming in there and the Greeks coming in there and the uh, Greeks really establishing themselves in Kemet and having you know so many years in there to pull out the information they are the ones that we really have to pay attention to the most now it's crazy because there's no way you can be an historian or a researcher and go back in that time and look at the fact that before Kemet fell you don't see the Greeks you know um, really dressing like the Egyptians and all that stuff that we've seen that I showed you guys from the um, museum you don't see all that stuff until after the conquest. So it's as if, you know, they was watching and waiting, you know, really being jealous and really waiting to go in there and to be like the Egyptians and have that knowledge. And it seems like, uh, you know, once they took it, they really embellished themselves within that information and uh, really got a lot out of it. But history wise, when you go into the Bible, again, there is no way. You can have these stories about these ancient times and not mention Alexander. You will not see Alexander mentioned in the King James Version, which is the authorized version. This is the, this is the version that they gave us. This is important to understand about the King James Version, how you can't just be, you know, crazy with it and just, just off look it. You have to really accept this version and why it was given, given to us because there's a lot behind it. So, when you realize that it does not speak of Alexander in the King James Version, it speaks of Darius, but we don't see nothing about the Ptolemies or Alexander in the King James Version. And as I mentioned before, you have to really know about the Ptolemies if you're talking about biblical history, because they play a huge role. So, as I said, they took out the Apocrypha, or what they call the Deuterocanonical books, the Apocrypha, which is you know about 15 books that basically was in between the Old Testament and the New Testament in the King James Version until about you know the 1880s when they took it out. Just all of a sudden took out all of these books, and they said that they wasn't really um, you know as as uh, close to the other books, meaning they wasn't as divinely inspired 
as the other books of the Bible. So they remove them. Now, what makes that suspect and why this is important is because you have Maccabees, which we're going to get into first Maccabees, which is where it's talking about Alexander. It's talking about the Ptolemies. It's talking about that time. Now, when you read Daniel, as I was talking about before, it's also talking about the Ptolemies and Alexander, but it does not mention their names, which is really suspect. It's, you know, what's going on. So you can see how, as I showed you in part one, we found the history. We went back and looked at the fact that the Bible's history, talking about what was going on with the Phoenicians and Tyre, what was going on in those lands during that time and what really happened when Alexander came in there and destroyed that city. We see the actual proven history differs from what it's talking about in biblical history. They don't even mention Alexander, but we know that whole story has to do with him, but it's not in your Bible. But we can see that they clearly is talking about the same thing. And I showed you in part one how they mixed it up. How when we go back and find that the hidden meaning is actually telling you who would come into those lands and conquer it. So you see how they switch it up. It's the same thing. So what a lot of religious people do is they go in, they read the Bible, and the ones who do know history understand about the Ptolemies. So a lot of people pick up on the stories and say, you know what, this they're talking about the Ptolemies, even though they don't mention them by name. The issue with that is... If you don't go and look at actual history, a lot of people are believing that the story the Bible is putting out is actually real history. When that's not the case. The case is if you do not look at actual history and what many historians have you know, agreed upon, then compare it to the Bible, you won't get the truth. So when people see that the simple fact that, you know, the story exists and that in real history, you have a story. Difference is when you compare the stories, they are different. One is made to fit the biblical uh, version and one is the actual history. So you have to believe the actual history over the biblical version that is put there to steal, to to implant itself into history to give validity to the Bible. But when you look at the stories and see how they differ, then you find the parable. This is how you can see what it's talking about. So as we got in, uh, as we got into in part one. It's talking about, it's basically giving us the rise of the European powers, showing us that they are the bloodline of the so-called beast, uh, Satan, or what have you. These are the people who are controlling, and they're giving you these hints. As I talk about with the occult, they want this stuff to come out because it's our consciousness basically absorbing this stuff and getting ready to prepare the consciousness of the world for what's to come as far as biblical prophecy. As I said before, they are using our consciousness to create the reality that they want. So you need to get into these black folks heads, the people who can control this reality, exactly what's going on and who the culprits are and what the story is. So we can have that in us. But it's wrong history when you start to compare it. So they're giving us exactly what they have done. And what's going on. And when you compare it to actual history, you can see what's going on. And a simple fact that it's Greek history just gives you more proof that it was the Greeks, as I have been saying, that are the ones that have created these religions. Now, we had the King James Version. And for about 274 years, the Apocrypha was included within the King James Version. Even if you go and look at the original King James 1611 Bible, it has the Apocrypha in there. For them to take it out in 1885, it's like, for what? Why take it out? Now, if if you have a King James Version from that time, from the 1800s, you can look in there and see the Apocrypha in there. And now you have to be like really a skeptic about why take it out? You know, what is the point? Now, for a lot of people, the information was growing in the 1800s. A lot of people understood history and having those stories in there about Alexander is just outright explaining what happened, telling you who the boogeyman is, who the bad guy is. And uh, since we was freed 
1865, black people started to get knowledge and start to understand stuff. It was smart for them to take out those books, to take out the Apocrypha. And this way, we wouldn't be able to look at it and then go back and look at history and say, well, wait a minute, this is what really happened. Because now, you see, people don't care. You know, they don't, it don't, ma- it don't matter now. They won. It's all done. So they could put the books back in there, which they have done. And you can read about Alexander. They don't care about none of that stuff because the plan worked. Everything happened now. But now you can look at it and start reading about Alexander and Ptolemy and about the, um, the wars of the Diadochi, which we're going to get into. And it's like, so what? It's like a story. But when you're trying to get the truth about the validity of the book, of the Bible, and what actually took place, this is what you got to look at. And we're going to get into all of this because it's really important. And I'm going to tell the story about what happened and what took place during that time, during the wars, and why it's really important that we must look at this history. And the reason why I put out this series is because the history is the important part. Because without the history, we're not going to understand what really took place. And we're not going to know uh, why things are the way that it is. It's a huge you know, gap in between the fall of Kemet and the rise of the European powers as far as biblical uh, uh, supremacy and with the religions and how they used it to basically you know, put themselves in positions of power. And... When I say, I mean, it makes so much sense when you understand and you're really going to get that understanding when I say the consciousness, our consciousness is what helped them do it. So, as I said, if you do not possess the necessary tools, the power to create the reality that you want, you have to control the people who can. So. Once you instill these beliefs into the African people and then you send them out there to spread the word, because when the Hebrews are talking about the black, the African Hebrews, the African Jews. Yeah, of course, as I said, that's true. And they use them to spread that word and to go out and spread this religious consciousness. And they did it and it stuck and it spread as we can see it, because it's our consciousness that took it in. And since our consciousness is controlling everything and creating this reality, they used it to put themselves in positions of power and use our religious consciousness to infect the rest of the population with religion. So, as I said, they could not leave out Alexander. It's just an insult to any real historian who knows about that time for you to go into the Bible and not see anything about Alexander. This is one of the things like when I talk about you know, people who actually know history, who actually read the Bible and them trying to basically put biblical history into actual world history. The fact that he is not in the King James Version should tell you something when you understand actual history, that how could you not put this man in there? How could you not have a definitive, long story about him and Julius Caesar? It's like these two people have to be in there. The Ptolemies have to be in there. You have to speak about certain people to really give the validity to what you're speaking about on something of this magnitude. When you're talking about, uh, uh, you know, the son of God walking the earth and miracles or what have you, how do you leave this dude out? And and the more you understand about how much, you know, the Greeks uh, conquered and what they did, it's just it's an insult. And we don't realize it's an insult because we don't know history. We don't know what really took place. And we don't really get it. So we just go with the flow and what we have been brainwashed to believe as far as biblical history. But when you understand, it's how can you not put them in there? But in our Apocrypha, in First Maccabees, it says clear as day. It's talking about Alexander. So it says here, this history begins when Alexander the Great, son of Philip of Macedonia, marched from Macedonia and attacked Darius, king of Persia and Medea. Alexander enlarged the Greek Empire by defeating Darius and seizing his throne. He fought many battles, captured fortified cities, and put the kings of the region to death. As he advanced to the ends of the earth, he plundered many nations. And when he had conquered the world, he became proud and arrogant. By building up a strong army, 
he dominated whole nations and their rulers and forced everyone to pay him taxes. When Alexander had been emperor for 12 years, he fell ill and realized that he was about to die. He called together his generals, noblemen, who had been brought up with him since his early childhood, and he divided his empire, giving a part to each of them. After his death, the generals took control and each had himself crowned king of his own territory. The descendants of these kings ruled for many generations and brought a great deal of misery on the world. So this is how we understand how Ptolemy I Soter became king of Egypt, who Ptolemy I Soter was one of his generals. And you start to really understand what was going on around that time. So the reason why, you know, we mention Game of Thrones in this part is because when we go through this, you're going to understand where they got the whole entire concept from. I mean, when you start reading about this time and this history and what was going on between these generals, between these people who split up uh, these kingdoms and had different uh, different lands, you see Game of Thrones. I mean, everything that you see, if you watch Game of Thrones, you really going to understand this. Everything that you see and what's taking place in Game of Thrones is here. The only thing that is missing is dragons, but not really, not really. Because when you start to understand that in uh, Daniel, it's talking about dragons, as I pointed out. But also in the Apocrypha, one, we have Maccabees, where it's talking about Alexander getting into the Ptolemies. But also part of the Apocrypha, you have the whole story about Bel and the dragons. And in Bel and the dragons, it's talking about Daniel, which how fitting is talking about Daniel and in the book of Daniel is talking about the Ptolemies. So you do have dragons. And as, you, and as you get into the story, you're going to have female warriors and you're going to have, you know, the same terminology about king of the north, king of the south, the kingdoms, bending the knee. All of this terminology you hear, you read about when it's talking about ancient Greece and the Ptolemies and everything that happened in the wars of the Diadochi and what took place. It's nowhere around that. Game of Thrones is talking about the Ptolemaic Empire, the Diadochi War, and what was going on back then. Plain and simple. It's nowhere around that to me. The whole thing about Ptolemy being a bastard, same thing with Game of Thrones, all that kind of talk is in the stories when you start reading and getting into it. And as we get into it, you're going to see what I'm talking about and you can start to point out things. If you enter Game of Thrones, you'll understand exactly what it's saying. So now understand, we're going to get into the story. Now, when Alexander died, you know, of course, the best thing to do, even though he split up, he split up the whole territory, start splitting up the kingdoms. And the best thing to do is to try to really take his spot. Everybody knew that when Alexander died, the person who took his spot would be looked at as the true ruler. So even if it was, you know, something that came up with the kingdoms that they would go to this ruler as being the, you know, the final decision, the one who has the most power. Because you can't just split up kingdoms and then, you know, had his kingdom supposed to be full of just Greek people and equal. Somebody still has to rule. Somebody has to be the authority, even though they had kingdoms. So, of course, you're the ruler uh, in your kingdom, but really, the person who would replace Alexander would be looked at as the true king. So, you know, a lot of people tried to marry uh, Cleopatra, his sister, you know, when he died. And one of the things you'll understand, do not get caught up in the names. There are many Cleopatras. A lot of people has this, they got this idea that it's one Cleopatra. It's many Cleopatras. There are many Alexanders. There are many Ptolemies. When you start getting into the uh, stories, you'll understand that these names get passed down. But this is why you have Ptolemy the first, second, you know, what have you. Alexander the first, second, you know, fourth or what have you. Same thing with Cleopatra. So don't get caught up in the names. There's, there's more than one Cleopatra. So a lot of people tried to marry Cleopatra to, you know, get that marriage going so they can kind of sort of be the one who was looked at as the main king on the throne. Now, it was rumored that uh, Cleopatra was going to marry Perdiccas, who was one of uh, Alexander's generals. Now, this was a rumor. Now, a lot of people really thought that um, they actually got married, but it wasn't true. But in any case, the rest of the Diodoki, 
which Diodoki means successor. So you have the wars of the Diodoki, the wars of the successors of Alexander the Great, basically what it translates as. So, of course, since people hearing this stuff, the other kings, seeing that Perdiccas would probably marry Cleopatra, you know, they came together against Perdiccas. And, you know, even though it wasn't so, but Cleopatra remained single for a while, of course. And the whole thing was when Alexander died, if you remember the story, you understand his brother, Herodias, who was his older half brother, was supposed to take the throne. But he was mentally ill. You know, he, he was slow. He basically was, you know, mentally unfit to rule the kingdom. And, you know, um, Alexander understood this. He kept uh, Herodias with him and took him out to many battles. He kept him by his side. You know, it was his brother. He actually loved his brother a lot. But he knew he was weak and that he was feeble minded. He wasn't really there 100 percent. So Alexander wasn't really worried about him. So now Perdiccas was actually uh, named the regent of the kingdom of Alexander the Great. So since they looked at it and said that, well, this dude is slow, we can't really put him as the ruler. We have to elect a regent, which a regent basically means somebody who's going to basically be ruling in place until the heir becomes of age. Because remember, uh, Alexander's wife, uh, Roxana, was pregnant. And the whole thing was what she produced, a man or a woman. So that was huge. Everybody had to sit back and wait till she had the baby to see if it was going to be a male heir, which would be king eventually or a girl. So they basically named uh, Aridaeus as ruler. And it was a boy that she had, Alexander IV. They named them two as basically the rulers of the land. You know, basically in name only, like they would be like symbolic rulers, like monarchy, you might as well say. But the power would basically lie with Perdiccas. And he would be the one who basically uh, rules and really has the say so on what takes place until Alexander the Fourth, the Fourth became of age. So, of course, everybody's looking at Perdiccas as the true ruler. What he says goes. Of course, the other Diadoki, which you have to understand. You really have four main ones, but it's more who would later come into power. So we can't really stick to the, the main four. One being Ptolemy, the first Solter, and Perdiccas, of course. There's a lot more who would eventually come into power. And this whole war, this whole game of thrones, what would take place. So understand again, you have now Perdiccas ruling. And now everybody's looking at Perdiccas wanting that spot and paying attention to what he's doing and what's going on. The thing is... You know, as I said, Game of Thrones type stuff has happened. You have to understand, you have now Herodias, who was the older half-brother of Alexander the Great. They are both sons of Philip of Macedonia, who was basically ruling before. Now, what you have to understand is that uh, Philip of Macedonia, his brother was the king. And his brother had a son. Now, of course, when the king dies, the prince rules. You know, the heir is supposed to take over. That's how it was done in, in Greece. But, you know, when uh, when Philip the, Philip's brother died, his son was basically an infant, a baby, a child. So it could not rule. So Philip of Macedonia became the regent, just like uh, Perdiccas just became the regent. So you have Philip of Macedonia being the regent now and the heir waiting for the heir to come of age is what he's supposed to do. And then, you know, turn over the kingdom to him. So basically, Philip of Macedonia was supposed to turn over the kingdom to his nephew, Amentus. But instead of turning over the kingdom, what he did was declare himself king. Forget being regent. I'm going to declare myself king. And that's what he did. He declared himself king. Amentus came of age, but Amentus wasn't really, you know, in a position to challenge the throne, even though he is rightfully his. He didn't really challenge it. He didn't really, you know, care too much about it. He didn't really try to be a threat or a problem to Philip of Macedonia. He just basically conceded 
And what Philip did was when he had uh, his daughter, he gave his daughter to his nephew. Remember, this is how they do in these royal families, their bloodline. So he gave his daughter, Kenane, which a lot of you know who she is. We'll get into that in a second. Kenane, he gave Kenane to his nephew to basically marry her and basically go about their business. Now, the whole thing was Alexander was born, of course. Now, Alexander is coming up and Alexander knows that. He has basically somebody who can challenge him for the throne once his father dies, you know, and he didn't like that. So he did what any you know person would do in that position. He went and he killed her husband and he basically promised her that he would give her another husband, a powerful husband someday. You know, so he didn't want nobody to challenge him for the throne. So he wouldn't kill his cousin. So now you have later after Alexander dies, what happens was before he died, he promised his sister that, you know, she would marry this uh, powerful uh, lieutenant. Oh, I forget his name, but he was a guy who really helped out Alexander um, throughout his whole rulership. And he was really loyal to Alexander. So he wanted to reward him, reward him with marrying his um, his sister. But he got sick and he died before that could even happen. Now, again. We have fast forward to where now you have Perdiccas being the regent and running the kingdom in Alexander's place. So Kenene, who is a powerful warrior, she is very powerful and she understands that, you know, she would have been queen at some point and would have been ruling had her husband been alive that would have been able to take his place. So now she doesn't have a husband to step into that place or anything like that. So she focused her time on her daughter. Now, Kenene, as I said, was a warrior. She commanded armies. She was no joke. She defeated the Illyrian army and she killed the queen, you know, with her own hands. Everybody knew about her. She was very well respected. Now, she had plans of her own. She had a daughter, Eurydice, who she wanted to marry to her uncle, who was the one who was slow, uh, Eridias, who was her brother. So she wanted her daughter to marry her brother, which would be her uncle, her daughter's uncle. So her plan was to go ahead, take her daughter to uh, Macedonia to marry her uncle. And basically she would have, you know, some stake on the throne. That was basically stolen away from her by her brother. So her proposal was she was going to go there, you know, make it happen. And because she had respect and people liked her, it probably would have happened. So on her way there, of course, you had Perdiccas who understood that if I let her, who is really a rightful heir to the throne, you know, instill some kind of power in the kingdom, it would create problems for him. You know, she would be watching his every move. So what he did was he went and sent his brother out to intercept her on her way there. And he ended up killing uh, Kenene, who was a great warrior. You know, he ended up killing her. Don't know exactly how, but he got the job done and he killed her. So because she had so much respect and a lot of people really respected her and uh, revered her, and she was a good warrior, it kind of backfired on her because the council basically ruled that uh, Eurydice, her daughter, could still go ahead and marry her uncle, uh, Eridias. Even though he was slow, he wasn't that slow. He can, you know, sort of comprehend a little bit, but he wasn't really mentally fit enough to run an entire kingdom. But she went on ahead and married her uncle and uh, they got married. And now, you know, of course, she was basically, you know, trying to really pull his strings and control uh, his little bit of power that he did have, which of course she wanted to, she wanted him to have more power, more power he had, she had. So this was her game to really try to get his level up and to get the council and the people to recognize that he is a true heir. Even though he's slow, he deserves the respect of having more power than what he had. So Eurydice will eventually marry her uncle, uh, Eridias, but, uh, Eridias would change his name. 
to uh, Philip the Third. So uh, Herodias would become Philip the Third. He would marry his niece uh, Eurydice, and they would basically uh, become a small power in the Macedonian Empire, which of course uh, Perdiccas definitely feared and did not like. And he knew he had to eventually do something about that. So what happened was you had Perdiccas who was sending out uh, Alexander the Great's body. Now understand this whole marriage and everything that happened. All this stuff happened within the same year Alexander died. The marriage and everything. So you had a little bit later. You had Perdiccas sending out the body of Alexander the Great to basically go be buried where he was crowned king. So right where he was crowned king, his body was supposed to be buried. But... Remember, as I said, the other Diodoki was against him, one of them being Ptolemy I Soter. What Ptolemy I Soter did was go and steal the body from the men who was uh, transporting Alexander's body. So now after he stole Alexander's body, he was buried in uh, Alexandria, Egypt, which we know Ptolemy I Soter was the one who was crowned king or pharaoh of uh, Egypt. So, of course, after he stole the body, Perdiccas wasn't having that. So he basically set up an army to basically go in and invade Egypt and start a war with Ptolemy the First Soter. So here you have two of the Diadochi, two Greek warriors, soldiers in the army of Alexander who started the fight against each other. You know, and you had this war start to break out. The problem was Perdiccas wasn't as sharp as Ptolemy. And he was arrogant and he was crazy. So his battle plans, his military strategy was whack. He couldn't even cross the Nile and get into the main areas where he needed to strike. And his battle plans and uh, his strategy was, was horrible. And every time his men failed, he would, you know, execute them. He would treat them like crap. And eventually they got tired of it. So what happened was a few of his lieutenants, his leaders, came together and basically ended up killing them. <laughs> so here you have the regent, basically almost the king almost, who is in place of Alexander. And this dude invades Egypt, which kind of pissed everybody else off. Then he wasn't even able to make a debt into Egypt. And he was basically killing off his own men because of his incompetence and his generals and his, uh, his commanders or what have you. He, they just didn't like it. It was disrespectful. And they basically came together and they ended up killing him. So basically one of those men commanders was Seleucius. And Seleucius would eventually get some land of his own and begin the Seleucid Empire. Anybody who does any research on ancient history know about the Seleucid Empire. You can't miss it. So understand that's where that comes into play. And again, so much history, as I said, that you start breaking down once you understand just this part in these stories. So the whole Seleucid Empire came about because Seleucius was one of the commanders that killed Perdiccas, one of the first, or considered the first Diadochi successor of Alexander the Great. And so the, the successor, the Diadochi War began. And once uh, Perdiccas was killed, of course, you had uh, uh, Eurydice pushing for her husband, you know, to be in power, to get more powers. And a lot of people thought that that might happen, but of course it didn't because, of course, he was slow and they didn't want to, want to give him anything he really couldn't handle. So what happened was you had one of um, Philip of Macedonia, Alexander's father, you had one of his old lieutenants basically end up being voted in as being the new regent. So now Perdiccas is dead and you have one of the lieutenants of Philip of Macedonia taking over as the regent. Now you would think with Philip being, you know, so old and dying a long time ago, anybody who served with him would be old. So Antipater, who was the 
uh, lieutenant who served with Philip of Macedonia, he became regent. Now, he wasn't regent for long because he died of natural causes, you know, soon after. So everybody assumed that his son, Cassander, would take the place as regent. Because, again, that's how things usually go. Your son succeeds you, becomes your successor. And Cassandra thought that he would take the place if something happened to his father. And you had um, you had uh, uh, Eurydice and you had her husband, who was her uncle. Going to keep pointing that out because it's crazy. <laughs> you had Eurydice and uh, her uncle, uh, Philip III, basically push for Cassandra to be uh, the new regent of Macedonia. Cassander had already aligned himself with Ptolemy the first Soter and the other Diodoki who was against uh, uh, Perdiccas. So, you know, once he didn't get named uh, ruler or regent, you know, he was upset. Now, what happened was instead of uh, Cassander, son of um, Antipater, once he didn't get named, you know, as I say, he was upset. A lot of people assume he would get named. But what happened was you had Polypersian, who was a friend of Antipater, one of his friends. He got named as the regent because he was you know, closest to the king and he knew how to rule. And Cassander wasn't really looked at as a person who was really you know, ready, ready to rule. So you had uh, Polypersian take over as regent which pissed Cassander off and a civil war began between Polypersian and Cassander. And basically, uh, Polypersian was shocked that Cassander amassed the type of warriors that he did because, of course, he was in with Ptolemy the First Soter and the other Diodoki to basically, you know, have this allegiance for one of them being, you know, on the main throne. So when you look at the whole thing, you got to look at the seat of Alexander being the seat of power. So when you look at the seven kingdoms in Game of Thrones and you look at the fact that um, the Targaryen kingdom was like the main kingdom. They had the dragons and there was the main kingdom over the, you know, the seven kingdoms and over really basically everything else. So whoever ruled that kingdom was considered, you know, the ruler of the rest of the kingdoms It's basically the same thing here in Greece. Whoever ruled Macedonia, whoever ruled the place in place of Alexander would be considered, you know, the king of everything else. So they wanted it to be one of them, of course. So when you had Polypersian take over, Cassander go to war with him and Cassander basically get help and have um, Ptolemy the first Soter and Antigonus, which Antigonus was the one who basically destroyed the fleet of Polypersian. You had to come together and basically help help him defeat Polypersian, which he fled. And uh, eventually Cassander would basically try to take the throne. So now Polypersian was smart. He basically fled to um, Olympus, Olympias, whatever uh, Alexander's mother's name, how do you pronounce it? Olympias. He fled to her and he fled to Roxana and Alexander IV, who was Alexander, the great son who was the heir in waiting, you know? So he fled there and basically pled to Olympias and said, hey, you know, Cassandra's taken over. This, is, this isn't the way it's supposed to go. You know, basically help him out. And what, uh, what Olympias did, because she was powerful as well, she could fight, she had an army, and he basically got together the men that he had left who was willing to fight for him, and they amassed the army. While Cassandra was away, they basically went back into Macedonia and defeated the army there and basically took back the kingdom. So you had uh, Olympias going there. And remember, now you have Olympias there, but who's also there is Eurydice and uh, Philip the third, you know, named after her husband. So she understood that Philip the third was being used. And as long as he was alive, he was a threat to the kingdom. So he had to go. So she killed him. She had him executed and she forced Eurydice to commit suicide. So Philip III of Macedonia was executed 317 BCE and his wife Eurydice was forced to commit suicide. And Olympus basically assumed control of the kingdom for a while. And uh, she was basically, you know, 
you know, going on a rampage and killing everybody who she thought was a threat. She killed Cassandra's brother, all of Cassandra's uh, commanders and uh, his uh, soldiers that was there. She executed a lot of them. And, you know, she basically held on to the place for a while, though I think over a year until she was basically uh, ambushed. She was basically caught in a blockade in Pitna. And Cassandra caught her in a blockade and basically forced her to uh, surrender. And he told her, you know, if you surrender, then, you know, you can keep your life. I'll let you live if you surrender. She surrendered. And of course, he didn't keep his word, but he ordered a bunch of soldiers to execute her, which they didn't do it. They didn't want to do it. Nobody wanted to be known as the person that killed Alexander's mother. So that was tough. So what he did was he got the family members of all the people that she executed, got her enemies, got everybody together, and they stoned her to death. Stoned her to death. And now Cassandra understood the only people that was in the way of him taking the throne was Alexander's son, Alexander IV, and his mother, Roxana. So what he did, I believe it was 309 BCE, when Alexander IV was 14 and getting ready to come in to age of being crowned king, he had them both poisoned. Poisoned them both. And you can look at it just like in Game of Thrones when Joffrey, the boy king, was poisoned. It's the same thing. You had Alexander IV poisoned at like 14. I think Joffrey was like older, like 19, something like that in Game of Thrones. But this is where the story is coming from. It's the same thing. All this stuff is coming from the same place. And this is what they do. They know how to take stories and actual history and then manipulate them. Manipulate stories and plagiarize the stories to create something that they want to put out. But it's important that you know the story, which is why I'm telling it. Because it's important you understand what happened and the kind of things that was taking place within those kingdoms. So you can see how unstable things was. You know, so it's crazy. So eventually, you know, Cassandra would crown himself king and take the throne and would rule for a while. So now we go back and you look at the only person left, as I mentioned before, was Cleopatra. Cleopatra was left and the only person left that somebody could marry that could tie them to the throne and have some kind of stake in being, you know, uh, a true ruler or a person that had tr some kind of true uh claim to the throne. So yet Cleopatra eventually accept a proposal from Ptolemy the First Soter to marry. But before she can get married, she was caught by Antigonus and she was killed. So again, you know, this stuff kept happening. You had these wars. Nobody wanted anybody to really lay claim to the throne of Alexander unless it was them. So it was going to always be a war. Even people who allied, who they thought they was allies, they was going to fight. There was, it was always going to be a battle for that throne. Because that throne would be the throne to rule the rest of the thrones. And they all knew that. So you had, you know, this time, what a lot of people don't realize about Hellenization. When you have these empires that's basically controlling, you know, Egypt, the Middle East, Greece. So much land. This is the real Hellenization. Because now you got all these Greeks in control of all of these kingdoms. And now they're spreading the language and the customs of the Greeks. Which is why everybody spoke Greek around then. Everybody was speaking Greek because the Greeks ruled that whole area. Once you understand that, it's very easy for you to see how they could be the ones who created the Bible. It's not hard. See, the reason why the, the reason why the Hebrews are having trouble putting, putting this together as well as other Christians is because they don't look at the history. They don't know what happened. When you understand that these people in the Seleucid Empire, the Egyptian Empire, the uh, Roman Empire, which will later come, because during this time, while the, while the Greeks are fighting each other, you have the Romans, you know, building and basically breeding these cock diesel Warriors getting ready for battle because they see that by y'all fighting against each other, we're going to step in and take over. At the same time, you have the Persian Empire regaining strength, looking at the same thing. The Greeks keep fighting each other, killing each other. We need to just go in there and take the stuff from them because they can't get together and appreciate what they have. But with Hellenization, 
This is what you have. You have all these Greeks in these territories taking over and stealing Greek uh, language, laws and rules or what have you. And it's very easy to see how they was able to do what they did. So we can see this stuff in the Bible as we're going to get into when you start to understand the stories and what took place. You have later, you have uh, Antiochus II. Antiochus II was married to Laodicea. And they got into war, of course, with um, the Ptolemies. Now, Antiochus II ruled Syria. And uh, Antiochus, you know, the first or Antiochus was the one who discovered Antioch and Syria, what have you. Different story. But they got into it with Ptolemy uh, or Ptolemy II Philadelphia. You can say Ptolemy. I say Ptolemy. It's just a thing. But it's pronounced Ptolemy. But um, they got into a war. And basically to settle the war, uh, Ptolemy agreed to give his daughter to Antiochus II, who was already married. It's like, how are you going to give me a wife when I got a wife already? But to keep things, you know, peaceful, he gave up his daughter, uh, Berenice, Berenice. He gave up his daughter to Antiochus II. He divorced his wife, Laodice, married Berenice with the understanding that whatever children that they had would eventually rule. So now, uh, Laodice and Antiochus II already had a child, Seleucus II. But now you can see that when you, when you get into the story, when you understand that and you start reading in Daniel, you can see where that story fits in in Daniel. You can see what Daniel is talking about. So now when you read Daniel 11, 6, it says, and in the end of years, they shall join themselves together. For the king's daughter of the south shall come into the king of the north to make an agreement. The agreement I just told you about. But she shall not retain the power of the arm. Neither shall he stand nor his arm. But she shall be given up. And they that brought her and he that begot her and he that strengthened her in these times. So now it's talking about, as I said, the daughter of the king of the south, which would be better niece. The king of the south would be Ptolemy II of Philadelphia. The king of the north would be Antiochus II. Now, when it's saying that she will not retain the power of the arm. Now, what happened was you had Berenice and Antiochus II actually end up having a child, which that child, according to the agreement that it's speaking about, will be the heir. So now, unfortunately for Berenice, once they had a child, it somehow made Laodice, who is his real wife, he and Laodice basically came back together. They got back together once that child was uh, uh, conceived and once that child was born. It brought them two back together closer. And what uh, Laodice ended up doing, she actually killed the child of Berenice and her husband, Antiochus II. She ended up killing the child and killing Berenice. So when it says, well, neither shall he stand, well, after that, he died. So now what's left is her and her, her son, Seleucus II, that she had with Antiochus II. And it says, but she shall be given up and they that brought her and he that begot her and he that strengthened her in these times. So not only did Laodice kill, you know, their son and brother niece, but she killed like, you know, the uh, midwives, not the midwives, but basically like her caretakers. That basically brought her into this world and took care of her and raised her. She killed them as well. And we know her, uh, Ptolemy II of Philadelphia ended up dying. And, uh, of course, um, who strengthened her was, uh, Antiochus II and he ended up dying. And what, what happened later, as I said, Stucius II will take the throne along with his mother, uh, Laodice. So you have it right in the Bible. And when you understand the history and what it's talking about, it's talking about the Ptolemies. Without me even getting too much into it, all you got to do is read Daniel and listen to what Daniel was talking about. And it's telling the stories, talking about Darius and the story, the whole thing in Daniel, starting into Daniel 11. is talking about the Ptolemies. It's talking about Alexander and everything that was going on during that time. Clear as that. But they just don't use the names. 
But when you know the story and you know the history, you can match it up and see exactly what they're talking about. Because you can't make this stuff up. You can't just put it in there. You have to somehow attach it to real history to where people can actually see it. People can actually, you know, make a connection that will make the stuff seem legitimate. So even when you start seeing this stuff talking about the whole story and the agreement and that, you know, the king of the south and the king of the north, the king of the south daughter would basically go up to the king of the north. I mean, not too many people would even understand that. What does that mean? What are you talking about? Who are you talking about? But when you understand that history and what we're talking about, then you know what they're talking about. So now you have Daniel eleven seven saying, but out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north and shall deal against them and shall prevail. So when it's saying out of the branches of her roots, it's talking about her own son who will rise up in the king of the north, which will be in the kingdom of Antiochus II, and he shall prevail. It's giving you the Ptolemies, it's giving you Antiochus II, it's giving you this story of what happened in Greek history and is in the Bible. And it's hard for you to really understand it because they don't really put names. If they actually put the names in there, in Daniel, we would have understood this stuff for a long time. But instead, by them taking out Maccabees and taking out the whole Deuterocanonical books, the whole Apocrypha, and us not getting this understanding, we are left to piece it together. So now, you're looking at all this history, and you're seeing what's going on with the Ptolemies in Egypt, the uh, Seleucid Empire with Antiochus II, and nothing about the Jews. Nothing about the Jews before the 4th century BCE. So when you start getting into this time, where after Ptolemy had basically uh, taken Alexander's body and began to basically uh, the wars of the Diodoki, and you had this fighting going on, and during this whole time that we have Hellenization, that you hear nothing about any Jews or any Hebrews until after the 4th century BCE, when they began to establish this whole deception. And that's the thing, how you have this history being explained and this war that's going on and during this time the Hebrews or the Israelites supposed to have been doing anything but somehow in Israel which Israel would be part of the Seleucid Empire during that time nothing nothing so you would think that if there was God's chosen people in the Bible which true would have you they would not have been uh going through what they went through during that time. And definitely the Greeks wouldn't be ruling Israel during that time. So that's the whole thing. And that's one of the things they don't really get into is explaining um, the Greeks ruling. This is the part they really want to cover up the most. Because when you start to look at the real history, it's going to point straight to them. And you have to ask yourself that question. Where's the Jews? You know, where's the Jews in all this thing? What's going on? That we're reading all these stories in this whole Game of Thrones and the Jews don't come into play and, and no place. So you're going to read in first Maccabees about the persecution of the Jews and, you know, all this stuff about the Jews. And it seems like uh, and this is like second century uh, BCE around this time when they started to put the stuff into place. And the only reason why they have this in Maccabees about the Jews is to, again, put themselves into history to try to force themselves in there. So we know the only reason why it will be any problem with the Jews and um in that territory will be because any type of persecution will be because it's them trying to force Judaism on the Africans that was there. That's why they mention it because it's well known that they didn't just of course lay down and take it. You had a war. You had these Africans go to war with the Greeks, of course, and they lost. And eventually, once, you know, time set in and the people who was fighting the war is dead and gone or ran off, the people that's left, you indoctrinate them and you do that by generation. So once you teach that first generation and they know it, they pass it down. It's the same thing they they did to us later in slavery. Start passing down the information and just became normal. So you have these Africans eventually accept being Jews. 
Hebrews and begin to start passing this information down until eventually they will be completely, you know, wiped out of Israel. Won't be few left. And the ones that was really into the religion and had high places will go out and teach the religion to other Africans. And it was spread until the Arabs came and basically took over and forced everybody to scatter. And they would eventually take a lot of these Jews, a lot of these Africans and convert them to Islam. It's the same type thing. So we had this uh, Judaism push and it fulfilled its agenda. Its purpose was fulfilled as far as getting the information out there and planting it and passing it down to not just African civilizations, but to the uh, so-called um, the Arabs and the, the mixed Berber around that time because there's a lot of mixing going on and to uh, create this whole fictitious fake uh, Judaism when the Arabs came in and began mixing with the Greeks. But, you know, when you look at the war, you start to step back. We see that the Ptolemies would prevail and um, began to take over much of that territory. In fact, when you go to uh, 1 Maccabees uh, eleven thirteen, it says, Then Ptolemy entered Antioch and assumed the crown of Syria. So he wore both the crown of Egypt and the crown of Syria. Here you have it clearly mentioning Ptolemy's name. But remember, this is in 1 Maccabees, one of the Apocrypha books that is not in the King James Version that you probably have at church. Unless you got an older version or you have a version where they specifically say that it has the Apocrypha put in. And a lot of people know that when you grew up, that common King James Version that we grew up with did not have, that, did not have the Apocrypha in it. And even if it did, we didn't know what the hell it was anyway. So when Ptolemy did uh, rule both kingdoms... Egypt and Syria. You know what it says later. He was fighting against another Alexander and uh, he defeated him. Now Alexander fled into, uh, you know, uh, the Arab territories and Arabs basically caught him and cut his head off and sent it back to the Ptolemies. But Ptolemy died like a couple of days later, like three days after that. And you had uh, Demetrius take the throne. And uh, again, you know, war all over again. And you had this type of stuff happen over and over. So what would eventually happen? We know that Rome got their stuff together and basically uh, went to war with, with Greece. I think it was about 49 BCE where Julius Caesar, you know, began to rule. You know, that happened in Rome and uh, Greece with John had a whole Greco-Roman era. And so the stability you know, begin to uh, fall in place for the Romans and the Greeks. And to me, that was somebody with knowledge, understanding that they needed to focus more on the Africans and come together and stop fighting against each other and and understand how how powerful we were and what we could do. So you had them come together. You had, during this whole time with the Diadochi War, you had Rome basically being ruled by Africans, being controlled by Africans, and eventually the Aryans would come in and you had a dual system of Africans and Aryans, black and white people ruling and living together fine, with no problem. And meanwhile, you had the leadership, whoever was there, plotting to take over and overthrow the African rulership in Rome, which is what they end up doing. Plain and simple. The barbarians took over. And as I said before, uh, when Rome fell and people say that's the reason why, you know, we had the dark ages because Rome fell. But no, Rome fell and Rome falling was the fall of the African leadership in Rome, as I said, and the rise of the European powers. And they amassed the army long, uh, large enough. And we don't even know if they really fought or if they was on each other's side the whole time. We don't really know. We don't really know. We just know they came together, the Greco-Roman era. And remember, the Romans continued Hellenization and let the Greeks stay in the position, positions that they was and even had the Greeks write the New Testament. Remember, it's written in Greek. So, you know, who knows what really happened? 
Who knows what really happened? The Roman Empire could have been a, the Greek Empire the whole time. We don't know. We just got to go by the little bre- breadcrumbs of history that they leave us. But when you use common sense, it kind of, you know, it kind of doesn't work out. But that's what happened. So we had, as I said before, the Roman Empire would rise. But during that time, the Persian Empire was gaining, you know, steam and would eventually go head to head with the Roman Empire after they had laid claim to the lands that they took. And that battle would last up into the 7th century AD or CE. And remember, as I said, ended in the status quo antebellum with Islam being created after that. And we know that the Moors made a deal with them as well to, to basically take over these African territories. Because as I said, they had to turn their attention to the Africans. Because after all this war and fighting that was going on, they turned and looked and saw kingdoms rise up in Africa. And Africans have wealth and knowledge. They fighting and killing each other for hundreds of years for this power, for these thrones, for this information. And here you have the Africans start popping up with kingdoms all over Africa with knowledge, making money and doing amazing things. And they had to focus this their self on us and come together to conquer and take what we had so that we won't use the knowledge that was rightfully ours to establish a powerful, more powerful kingdom on the planet. Now understand we had already outnumbered them like crazy. Our problem was we wasn't united and they was. That's why we fell because they got their shit together and got united. We wasn't looking at it as a black white thing. They was looking at it as a white thing, a power thing and using that to their advantage as far as uh, getting in positions, making themselves look weak and like they wanted to learn or what have you. And, you know, being really good spies and moles and it will eventually bring down many African kingdoms. So we're going to get into, of course, in uh, part three, we really got to get into the Roman Empire and their rise and the Africans that ruled their territory and how Christianity was instilled and brought up. So we'll get into that eventually. But it's important to understand the Ptolemaic era and what happened during that time. So, again, you have to ask yourself, you know, why would they leave this stuff out of the Bible? Why wasn't we taught this stuff, uh, you know, in history class? Why would they leave all these stories, this whole entire history that I just gave you? A lot of you don't know about, never heard of before. And the movies didn't tell it all and tell it like it was. Why would they leave it out? And of course, you got to look at the fact, as I showed you in Daniel, clearly talk about the Ptolemies and what happened. Don't use the names, but we know it's talking about the Ptolemies. But you got to think about it. Wasn't the Old Testament supposed to be written in Hebrew? Supposed to be written in Hebrew, right? How, why is it Daniel is an Old Testament book? So it's supposed to be written by the Hebrews. Why would the Hebrews know that story? How would the Hebrews know that story to write it? Think about that. So they're supposed to have been there and witnessed all this stuff that I just talked about and put it in Daniel. The whole war against the uh, king of the south, king of the north, the agreement. How would they know that? And of course, biblical people would say, well, the Lord told them that. So the Lord told them all that to write all that, but they somehow can't fit themselves in the story. So basically it was just some Hebrew or Jew around high and, you know, writing this stuff or uh, people going to believe that God gave them that story and told them to just write it out. And this is how biblical people think or religious people think, I should say. I think that God just put this story in their head. But if that's so, it's, it's incorrect. We know when you read the whole thing. It's not saying the exact same thing as what happened in history. So we can't use that as well. But it goes to show, since we know we got the Septuagint Greek and that the Greeks wrote it because it's their history, it makes a lot more sense. Why would Hebrews even put that in their 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 law? Because remember, the Torah is supposed to be their law, their story, their laws, the laws of Moses and what have you. Why is this Greek stuff in there? So this information is for you to help put together the pieces 
for you to help put together these pieces. Because now when you start to listen to it, you can really see exactly what happened and how after Kemet fell, exactly what was going on and how they got into these positions. Now, I've showed you before when I went to the Cairo Museum in Cairo. And now it makes a lot more sense when you go through that video and you see how one, as I said, they tried to copy off of Kemet. You had Zeus Aman, you had Serapis, and we can see exactly what was going on. You can see how they start changing their their um their culture into Egyptian culture with the stellas and everything else. Dressing like the Egyptians and decreeing themselves as, you know, pharaohs or what have you. Plain and simple. It's just like it's like so much corny, like a joke. It's embarrassing to me, you know, if I was a, a Greek to see them do that. Like where is your own culture? And it's crazy how you have this Greek culture that's supposed to be so they're supposed to be so proud and they got Zeus and what have you and everything like that. But as soon as they conquered Kemet, they took the Egyptian culture because they knew it was the truth. And they knew their culture was based off of Egyptian culture anyway, but they wanted to deal with the Egyptian uh knowledge and not their own. So they really tried to push their beliefs on the Egyptians in um, Israel to try to get those generations to take that information while they take the Egyptian information. They wanted to switch places. And this is basically what they have effectively done. When you pay attention to what's going on and how they do us, we have switched places. They took our knowledge and turned us into who they was not having knowledge. They was looking up to us as being the knowledgeable ones, the people who had all the knowledge. Now we're looking up to them. We was sophisticated, refined with wealth. Now they are sophisticated, refined with wealth, and we are in a low state like they was. Plain and simple. So they have revo reversed the roles throughout history and been trying to put us in their place while they take ours. I mean, I see that happening today, even still, with people who don't even understand how they sound so much like white folks. As I talked about before, you know, you go back in the 1970s and 80s, black people are not going to kill a 17 year old black child over some stuff in the house. Over over some material possessions, they're going to catch him and beat his ass and take him to his mom. They're not going to say, well, I would have killed that nigga, too. Why would you why would you even say that? That tells you, as I said, they were reversing the roles. That's something a racist white man would say. Oh, kill that thieving nigger. Now you got black people saying that over some stuff in the house that they would kill a young black man. They're reversing the roles. They have been doing it throughout history. And when you understand history, you can see exactly what they did and what they're doing and why they're doing it. So, as we know, they have to write themselves into history and they have to justify all of the Stellas, all of the reliefs that's in Kemet. Uh, there's Philip the Third, Aridaeus, his relief in Karnak, because you're going to find them in Kemet a lot, and a lot of reliefs, a lot of carvings on the wall, because they wanted to beat us so bad when they got this information, and. The Egyptians wouldn't have it. And it's basically what it was. It wasn't like the Egyptians was just going to basically, you know, accept it. I mean, how could you accept it? If somebody just walked into your home, you know, killed your parents and then tried to be your parents. You're going to fight every chance you get. It's like, how are you going to kill my parents and try to take their place? Start wearing their clothes, trying to sound like them, talk like them, boss you around. You're not my, you're not my parents. Who are you? And this is what they was doing. And the Egyptian people wasn't accepting it. So they use, you know, uh, generations, you know, it's like generational corruption. And again, you know, if this generation pass away, the kids, whatever the kids know, all of us adults, when we gone, that's what's going to be at the forefront. So you don't really worry about the adults. You go after the kids and they still have that whole thing in place today. They're not worried about us. They want the kids. Plain and simple. So we're going to be gone soon. The kids is going to have the information that they have and they're going to go around with it. So if you're implanting in the kids' head when they go to school, 
that, you know, some rapist is God and Ptolemy the first Soter was a God and, you know, you're a Jew or you're a Hebrew and this is, this is uh, why this happened to you or what have you. The kids are going to grow up with this information and they're going to pass it down and it's just going to stick and it's going to become, you know, fact. It's going to become history. And everybody who know the truth is going to be dead and gone except for the people at the top who instilled it and who is enforcing this truth. And that even the people that that's going to come and enforce it later are going to believe that it's actually true, not knowing, you know, the real history. They're going to believe that it's true and that the reason why that they're they have their job is to make sure that it's enforced. So they had to really, really, you know, uh, get this information pounded into the children's head so they can pass it down. They allow Egypt to be covered in sand to cover their tracks. They made sure that the Arabs took over Kemet so we don't take it over and understand who he is and everything like that. They made sure. You got to think about it. They could have defeated the Arabs and taken Kemet from them, but they got everything out of it. They let the Arabs take it, and that's where they wanted to be there. As long as we're not there, they can't be there. Think about Egypt. Think about how much they try to be like us so much. How much they try to claim Egypt. We see it all the time. We see it in the movies. They want to claim that Kemet was white and that the ancient Egyptians was white. Wouldn't it be better if you're actually there to do so? You don't see the Arabs coming out claiming that, you know, all that stuff and the pyramids and everything that they, that, that's there, they build. You have some ignorant um, uh, Arabs that might say that. But when you go there, especially when you go to the pyramids, they'll tell you straight up. No, these are your ancestors. As I pointed out when I was there. They call you Nubian, they call you Pharaoh, they call the women's queens, Nubians or what have you, and say, welcome home. You know, this is exactly what I experienced in my times in, in, in Kemet, and that's how they talk to you as if Kemet is yours. But think about how the Europeans try to take it and, and they want it so bad. Why not just take the land? And we know they can't take it because they can't survive there. You can't have a society in ancient Kemet. That's full of white folks. They would die. It's no way they could survive there as a civilization. So they would rather it go into the hands of the Arabs than for the Africans to take it and understand their true history and who they are. This is a common sense thing that just shows you it's more to us. Because it's no way in the world, no way in the world that anybody would believe that that land is theirs. And the Arabs themselves is telling you that it's ours. And unless you go there or unless you really pay attention, you won't see that. So we know it's bullshit, but they own the mainstream media and everything like that. So they can say what they want, because, you know, when it comes to the news, people believe it. But common sense and uh, facts, when you go there and pay attention, you see who the people is and uh, who the territory, the country actually belong to. But the key thing you got to really pay attention to, as I said, is, is just to look at uh, how they went to war with each other. The Diadochi War and how they killed each other and what they was willing to do to assume the throne. I mean, one of the reasons why Game of Thrones is ending because it's not much more to tell. You know, it's not much more to tell. You can end it however you want to end it, but that's basically how, you know, it ends for real. You know, eventually they, they stay in power and they keep going. So just imagine the Lannisters winning in Game of Thrones and then that's it. All the dragons are gone. People are, you know, not happy. And the Lannisters win. And then life just go on. That's basically what happened. So it's interesting to see how Game of Thrones is going to end. But it shouldn't end the right way. But it probably will because it's how they get us with the movies. But um, in real life, if you want to look at it that way, the Lannisters win. And it is what it is. But it's no reason for them to continue it because they basically told the entire story and they don't have any more history they can put into it to keep it going. Like a lot of people don't understand when they put out a lot of these movies that seem to be good or a lot of these TV shows that seem to be good. They're telling their story and getting out. And only the people who understand the esoteric meaning is going to get it. Look at V. Even with V, the whole thing with the uh, reptilians and everything coming to Earth and all that. Why did that end? Well, that was a good series. What happened? You know, how could you take that off? One, it was revealing too much. But two, it's like, what more can you say? You can't give away too much. But it's like, 
Again, you had that series. It was another series that came out that was good. It's a couple of these series that was coming out that was really good and had a lot of insight that was just, you know, taken off the air. So the Ptolemaic Empire, you see it a lot. You hear about it a lot when you actually dig into this stuff. But it's something that they just don't put out there. I mean, for this kind of dynasty, you would expect them to have movies, you know, TV specials. They talk about Hitler a lot. Hitler ain't got nothing on the Ptolemies. Everywhere you look, it's Hitler, Hitler, Hitler. Nothing on the Ptolemies. Nothing about that time. You get the little movies, 300 and all that type of stuff, dealing with the Greeks. I would have you, but you don't get nothing on the Ptolemies. You don't see nothing about the Diadochi War, the War of the Successors, and really a real true you know, story about Alexander and everything that really took place in history. And we don't even get movies on the establishment of, you know, the Jewish power. They give us biblical, the biblical explanation of how it came about and the fact that it doesn't fit right into actual history. And this is this is stuff that's it's, it's important history for those of you who understand to piece this in and really get it and really get where this stuff fits at, because, um, it's that gap that a lot of people just don't understand this information and a lot of people don't know where to look to find it. Because when you start reading in uh, the Bible, especially if you are smart enough to comprehend that Daniel's talking about Alexander the Ptolemies, then a lot of people look at that as actual history and don't go back and look at the real history to make that connection. But when you go back and look at the real history, you can see that it's different from the Bible and why. It's important to backtrack that Ptolemaic era, that Ptolemaic era to Kemet to make the connection of how they created the Torah and why, you know, how they was able to do it. And the fact that nobody else could have done it. Ain't no Jews running around pushing, you know, the Torah and doing all these wars and fighting the Amalekites and the Girgashites and the Perishites and the Jebusites and all that stuff. Where, where this stuff is at? When, is it, when did this happen? Because it's supposed to have been all BC time. But how could it happen in territories that was run by the Greeks? It doesn't make sense. So as I talked about before and I pointed out, when it's talking about the whole Jewish war that Josephus talks about, when you have the Jews basically go ahead and attack the Romans, again, as I said, these were African Jews that was attacking the Romans, attacking Rome because Rome had basically executed order 66 <laughs> just like they did with the jedi and basically turned on the african power there and that was a war all that stuff is to cover up the fact that you had these african people fighting to take back rome which rightfully belonged to them and they they don't even try to hide it too much now when they start talking about the black caesars and everything like that and the rulers of rome during that time you can't hide the stuff. I mean, they're right there. And it's easy for you to piece this stuff together. I mean, we, we, can't, we can't let these people get away with stealing our history. So you need to know it. And this is one of the reasons that I'm putting out this series so you can know the stories and know the actual history. So when it's time for you to talk about it, you done heard the truth, you know the story, you know what's up. This is a very important DVD, very important information and video that I really just saved you guys a lot of time and effort trying to piece together and figure out exactly what happened and where to go to get the truth. The books that popped up that you've seen is books you need to read and understand, but not really because this is the story in a nutshell. It's a lot more history to go with it. It's a lot more Ptolemies, a lot more Alexanders, a lot more wars that happened with the Diadochi for a long time. And these people slaughtering each other for the throne. Now, if you follow me on Instagram and on my own my Facebook page, I talked about the uh, Masonic Bible that I have here. This uh, Hawning Masonic Bible that was given to me uh, by a Mason friend of mine. And, and you have Masonic Bible. And, you know, it's a little bit different. Different in some ways from the King James Version. It's a really good edition. And, it, you know, we're going to get into this. And there's actually another Masonic Bible on the way from a Masonic friend of mine that's older. That's a better version than this. But this is good to have. 
to compare with um, uh, actual uh, actual King James versions for you to um, piece together this information. But well, we're going to get into this stuff because the history is really important. It's really important to know and to see what happened. And we're going to really get into these kingdoms in Africa that I always talk about that rose up, why they rose up, how they rose up, and exactly what they was doing when we start getting into this ancient history. This part is really important to know because you're going to see how it fits later on. And, um, you know, these kingdoms, you know, these Africans that fled the war and were smart enough to get out of there with this information, and I guess they sat back and watched the uh, Greeks destroy each other, and they figured, well, they're going to wipe each other out. Let's just, you know, do what we do, you know, and um, they had no clue. You know, a lot of them had no clue. A lot of people was wiped out and uh, a lot of people was killed during this time. A lot of people died, a lot of Africans. And you would think when, you know, when they took over Kemet, because they were smart in, in how they did this. But you were thinking when they took over Kemet that the Africans that did escape would go into lower Africa and really warn everybody about the Europeans and what they was doing and how they was taking over. Again, you know, the biggest thing is we had no unity back then. Unity would have saved us. And you would think that once that happened, no European could come into a African kingdom and take over. So they were smart in how they did it. And you know, it's, it's, it's tough to push unity now because so many people have opinions and it's hard for us to come together because we got opinions. But I believe that if everybody take care of themselves, take care of you, take care of your family, try to put out information and help whoever you can, but really focus on you, then we'll be fine. If you're conscious and you can help somebody else become conscious, and if all of us become conscious as individuals, the rest will work itself out. Because us trying to say, let's come together and let's unite, it's not going to happen. We're going to keep button heads. People are going to keep coming in with their ideologies and their religions and their opinions and their facts and what they believe to be right and true. But if you're conscious, if you take the time personally to get the information, then you'll be fine. And if you can encourage others to do the same, to get the information personally, they'll be fine. So on and so forth. Everybody in a rush to prove the next person wrong. The debates was good. It's a good thing for the debates to come out and um, for people to really debate biblical religion and to understand what's going on. But the debates became more like, you know, hip hop rap battles to some people and not so much about the person who loses converting. I will be all for the debates. I would debate a lot if it meant that if I prove my point over you, that you would convert, not even convert, just accept the information, accept the truth. You know, and that's not what's happening. It just makes a person more angry, you know, at, you know, the person with the truth, with the facts. And that's what happens. So I try not to really debate people so much when I'm when I'm debating, when I'm actually doing it. My point I like to get across is that this is information that is the truth. I'm not trying to play you in no way. I want you to really accept this information and understand it and really just do your own research. When you got the truth and you got history on your side, you can say that. You know, these people, these Hebrews and these Christians kicking this stuff, they're not saying to you, go do your own research. All they can say is, go read the Bible. It's in the Bible. Read the book. Because if you go do your own research, they know you ain't going to read their book the same no more. Plain and simple. They understand that. So history is really important to understand and to know where this stuff fits at as far as the history of African people. So now, you know, I'm not really endorsing the Apocrypha, the Deuterocanonical books. You know, when you read uh, Baal and the Dragon, even still, like these books being out of the King James Version conflict with the King James Version. It contradicts. Like, even with Baal and the Dragon, with Daniel, it gives two different reasons why Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. It differs from the actual King James Version. Because you have, remember with Baal and the Dragon, Daniel was basically saying that, you know, there is no dragon, really. No dragon is actually coming in there. It's people that's faking this whole thing. And they come up with like a scheme to basically 
put food on the table. So basically, if the dragon eats the food and the food is gone in the morning, then Daniel, you know, gets killed. So Daniel was smart and he put like coal on the floor. And then in the morning they go in there and, you know, the food is gone. So he's ready to be like, you know, you're dead. But then they look and see the coal marks leading to these people who basically was the ones who ate the food, who was perpetrating the whole lie. And, you know, those people get killed and Daniel lived. But basically the people is like they were so beloving of the story of the dragon and the dragon being real and everything like that. That they was mad at Daniel and they wanted to throw him into the lion's den. So that's one version. Then, of course, you have the other version where you have them basically saying that nobody go to anybody else for, you know, prophecies or what have you, but to like the, uh, the king or what have you. And of course, you have Daniel praying to God and everything like that. So he was thrown into the lion's den. So you have two different stories. So you have magical things and uh, a lot of different stuff that that's in the apocrypha that really just kills the Bible. It's like, what is this stuff doing? Here? What is this stuff about? It contradicts it in uh, so many different ways. And again, they know and don't expect you to read it as a whole for you to figure this stuff out. So, you know, what I'm saying for you to understand is it's like when I say if you just read the book, there's no way you can read the book and accept this stuff as actual fact and history. So, it's just crazy. The message just stands out to you uh, when you read it and you understand what it's talking about. But if you don't know actual history, it's just no way. If you don't know about the occult, you don't know about any esoteric uh, books or knowledge, you would never put this stuff together. As I said, you can only go as far as what you know. If I put a riddle, a puzzle in front of you or, you know, just some information for you to decipher. You can only decipher it based on what you were told. If you don't get no new outside information to help you figure out this puzzle, you'll never figure it out. You can only go by what you know. And that's basically what happened with us when we start accepting these doctrines and books. We went by what we know. A lot of people don't know about riddles and decipherment and what have you and parables and everything like that. We look at the stuff and we read it and we say, oh, you know, it is what it is. And we go by how we was taught in the church. And that's how they wanted to go. So if you're not willing to accept the outside information and to learn it and to take it in, you're going to continue to be fooled by, you know, what they put out. And again, you know, I wanted to get this out because it's important information. It's going to help us as we go along. And it's a lot more to this. That's just so deep. <laughs> It's so deep, but we're going to get into it. We're going to crack everything open. And I did this series specifically for this reason, because I didn't want this history to not be known. And when we get into, because we're going to also get into uh, the Syriac, the Peshitta, and everything that's going on. Again, we just was just talking about Antiochus II in Syria. So what that whole thing is about, you know, remember, they said they called it Christianity in uh, Antioch. Remember that in the Bible, I believe it's Acts 11, 2 or something like that. But in Acts, remember, it's talking about it was called first called Christianity in Antioch. Think about that. And you have Antiochus and you have that whole thing going on with the who? Greeks. The Greeks, the oldest synagogue or Jewish synagogue in the world is where? It's in Delos, in Greece. So all this stuff is pointing right to the Greeks and showing you who the ones who are the ones who created this whole biblical deception? But you can also see, and what I wanted to point out, it's where they get a lot of their stories from. A lot of their movies and TV shows come straight out of the Bible, which come from real historical events that happen that they are smart enough to finagle and switch around. And for those in the occult to be able to look at it and say, okay, he talked about the Ptolemies. This is good. Good job. And that's what they do. And now, because you, you've seen this, you can see how they do it and because you watch a lot of my videos, you see what they're doing and, I, and that's what it's about. That's really what it's about. If you are into this esoteric stuff, and into this information, you can piece it out like we just did and um, you can figure it out. But this is what they do. Plain and simple. They get kicks out of it. They do it for whatever reason, but it has to do with altering our consciousness and many other things. But we see what they're doing and we know 
This stuff comes from a history, somebody's history. So finally, again, it's important for us to understand history, especially our history and true history. So we are not accepting the lie into our consciousness as a fact, because what's it's in us, it's in us, you know, it's in us and we believe in it and we think it's true. And we put this energy out there as if it's true when we know they lie. History is a lie and it's important for us to know. And um, they're going to hide. Of course, they're going to hide the Ptolemy uh, era. This history that I just given to you, you're not going to really get it all. It's a lot more to it, as I said. But it's important for you to understand and know it and get into you as get it into you as being the truth of what really happened and what was going on. It's not so much uh, as uh, being meaning, meaningless information. It's important. Remember, as I said before, one of their biggest plans that when you start following this stuff back, that they was going to do, that they was going to try to come out and declare themselves as the bloodline or relatives of Jesus to try to uh, push uh, their whole new world order agenda, what have you. This is something that a lot of people was talking about, you know, in uh, I believe like it's the, the 40s and 50s. And a lot of people who understood, I mean, this stuff is not new, this whole Illuminati thing. And uh, everybody, there's a lot of people that was into this information for a long time. But they had already was talking about how the um, Bavarian Illuminati was supposed to have uh, come out and push the Rothschild family as being the Holy Family. And they still call them the Holy Family as being the heir of Jesus Christ. What really that mean is their bloodline goes back to the Ptolemies. It goes back to these people who set this stuff in place. And that's basically what it is because they are the ones who created, you know, Jesus and all this other bull crap. It's their bloodline. It's the same thing. It's just time is passing. And when you start to really think about how long ago this was, you got to really, you know, it gets deep, as I talk about in many videos. But I wanted to get into this and get this piece of history out because it's going to fit with part three so well. And so many other things that we're going to get into that's really important to understand this part and understand that, you know, during that time, when you look at the territories that they that they crowned themselves kings of, it's everything. It's the Middle East. It's Europe. You know, Egypt, and we see how they shifted their power and spread it over to Northern Africa, Spain, and what have you. It's really important because you see the beginning of their conquest right there, plain and simple. And uh, it's, it's, it's no way you can get around that. You see it right there, clear as day, but you got to trace it all the way back and see where it stemmed from and see that these people ain't just get, you know, Divinely, you know, put in positions of power as kings and queens by God, as the Bible would have you believe. You know, talking about in Romans, how God put them in place. They were ordained by God to basically be the powers that be. So now you understand how, of course, we know they conquered their way onto the throne. They took over with deception and murder, rape, torture, bribery, whatever you want to add to it. And that's why they are in power. And because we had we had such a, you know, a, a good nature about us, we was kind, we wanted to help. We couldn't fathom that they would do what they'd done to us, you know, and we wasn't united, which is the main part. You know, they took over, plain and simple, and we're, we're still dealing with it. And this information is, is just tip, tip of the iceberg. We got a lot to get into, but. I want to thank you guys for being patient on this one and let me get through this story and get this out there because it's important. And uh, I appreciate the support and everybody who's been supporting and not really complaining too much about anything. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's getting a lot busy for me. I have a lot you know, going on personally. So, um, you know, I want to get out as much as possible. I have a lot of plans for 2018, a lot of major things I'm trying to do. I really have a lot that, you know, if I put my foot down and and work hard this year, you know, 2019, 2020, I set myself up to be in a really good position uh, financially. And um, I really be able to do a lot because my, my focus is really on my site. As I talked about, I really want to get that going. We need that. We need a platform for us that that's that's Internet based that we can really use in poor resources to 
to get a lot out of the uh, out of social media and out of the Internet. We can't let them have this. Like we got to understand how important this is. And I talked about my stuff being censored. I showed you guys and how, you know, some of my videos on YouTube has, has been censored and taken down. It's really important, as I talked about before, that we get our foot in somewhere before it's too late. Trust me on this one. We don't want to miss the boat on this one. It's important to get our foot in somewhere and have some kind of stable ground as African Americans, as black people in this Internet before they take it over. Because if we don't, we are so screwed for the future. And I don't think people really understand that. And I don't really want to get too much into it and put videos out on it too much. Because I don't want, you know, that kind of information to get out as far as me understanding what I understand. It's not really good, but we got to just do. We got to act and do what we need to do and show these corporations and companies that we are not with censorship, especially when it comes to our history and information that we need to know. We got to fight for that. Plain and simple. I talked about uh, how I wanted to just promote this video. That was basically, uh, you know, poking fun at Christianity and Facebook won't even accept money to promote a video that's already circulating on Facebook. You can share it all you want, but if you want to pay to boost it so people can see it like, you know, all around, they won't let you do that. That's that's serious. That's telling you how it's getting. So we really got to get our foot in the door and really start establishing everybody, each one of us more uh, websites and things that is like really geared towards holding on to this information in our history before it's gone. And we got to keep spreading it and teaching it to each other and to our children before it's gone, before it's censored, before they get to a point. And this, this is what they want to do. They want to get to a point where they can say, oh, you tease and white folks. So we're not going to let you promote that. Oh, you tease and black folks. So we're not going. We're not going to let you promote that. That's where we're headed. So while we jumping on the bandwagon on all this, as I talked about in the video that's about to come out on YouTube, we're jumping on the bandwagon of all this, you know, uh, coolest monkey in a jungle and all this touchy feely stuff, not knowing what we asking for. Y'all don't get what they doing. They present a problem and then present the solution. So all this stuff we get so touchy feely about, eventually they're going to say, well, guess what? We're not allowed to put this out because it's offensive to the black people. You're not allowed to put this out. It's offensive to the Arabs and the Muslims. You're not allowed to put this out because it's offensive to white folks. So when we try to talk about our history and what really happened to us, guess what? It's going to be offensive to white folks. So you can't talk about it. This is what we're headed. This is what we're headed to. Understand what they're doing and how they work and how they move. We can't let it happen. So we got to have our sights, our freedom of speech, our way to not be stuck in that platform where they control what we can say and what we can put out is very important. This history is important and we got to know it. Plain and simple. So, again, thanks for your support. Thanks for uh, taking the time to watch and understand what I'm trying to do. And, you know, I really appreciate it, guys. And I'll see you guys next video.